The Battle of Dagorat severely demoralizes the revolutionaries. With the loss of men and gunpowder, their ability as a fighting force is critically diminished. Overthrowing the Dutch by military means is now a fading hope. The Dutch, however, are unable to press home their advantage. A new outbreak of disease sweeps through their ranks. In late July, Coffey reopens negotiations with Van Hogenheim. Realizing he is unable to launch another big military offensive, and with food supplies dwindling, he no longer demands half of the colony, but now wants just four estates. Coffey has no other option but to accept the governor's response that he has to await advice from Holland. In the months after the Battle of Dagorad, another fearsome fighting force has entered the arena, the Carib Indians. In the upper Burbies, they attacked the group of freed slaves stationed in and around Plantation Savonet, killing as many as 100. These Indians have been mobilized in Demerara and are sent into Burbies by the Dutch governor of Demerara and Esequibo, Storm Van Gravesandy. Coffey, recognizing the value of the Indians, had tried on several occasions to win their support, but they opted to fight on the side of the Dutch. In October, a major turning point occurs in the revolution. Another bitter dispute erupts among the top leadership. Coffey's right to command is challenged by Atta and others. Atta is one of the newly arrived slaves. They regard any dialogue or negotiations with the whites as acts of weaknesses. The recent military setbacks also undermine Coffey's authority. Coffey realizes he no longer commands the respect and trust of his top lieutenants. He fatally shoots himself with a musket. The little that we know is that when Atta was asked why he called a council to depose Governor Coffey, he denied that he did. Akabrace said that, I mean, he was rather more expansive on the subject. Akabrace said that Atta called together his army officers and asked them if Coffey was right to write all these letters to Van Hogenheim. And his army officers supported him. So Coffey then called his army officers and they supported Coffey. Um, there is then this huge gap in the story and Coffey commits suicide. One has to infer, therefore, that Coffey really did not have the support in the army which he needed. More particularly, one supposes, since eventually Atta himself became the chief. So one must presume, in actual fact, that Coffey found that he did not have military support. And one can only presume, although um, somebody with perhaps more expertise in the field of African studies would probably have to say so, that um, within the context of some West African traditions, Coffey then decided his only option was to commit suicide. Atta assumes command of the revolution, but he does not have the vision and organizing skills as Coffey. He fails to win widespread support. The revolutionaries begin to form splinter groups along tribal lines with their own commanders. Food production quickly falls into disarray. Starvation becomes the new enemy. By now, in Holland itself, military forces have been mobilized and dispatched to Burbies. In early December 1763, four shiploads of reinforcement arrive with over 300 sailors and soldiers. The Dutch are now ready and able to launch an all-out counterattack. They launch a three-pronged assault, one along the Kanji, one along the Demerara to circle the revolutionaries from the back, and the main assault up the Brebis River with six ships. Despite this massive military force, the battle for Burbis continues 
well into the next year, 1764. Many revolutionaries, now splintered into several groups, do not consider surrender an option and decide to fight to the end. A large force under Atta, the new leader of the revolution, is holed up in the Wiki Creek area. For most of January 1764, the Dutch make several attempts to overcome these forces, but without success. Atta and his men proved to be tenacious fighters, despite the superior Dutch firepower. The Dutch lose several dozen officers and soldiers. In late January 1764, the Dutch send a large contingent of soldiers and successfully dislodge the revolutionaries from the Wiki Creek area. Many of them escape and scatter throughout the forest. Atta himself goes into further hiding. Quite apart from Atta's men in the Wiki area, the Congo Africans, under their resourceful and respected leader, Akrabe, set up a maroon camp. The camp consists of 50 to 60 huts and is cleverly fortified and concealed. The Dutch forces attack his maroon camp from three sides with over 150 soldiers equipped with mortars. Akrabe has no response to this firepower and is soon captured along with most of his fighters. A month later, in April, Atta is captured in the Wiki Creek area after Indians inform the Dutch of his hiding place. The net is closing swiftly around the remaining revolutionaries. They are gradually captured or killed by the Dutch forces, aided by the Caribs and other Amerindians. A few of the former leaders of the revolution disgracefully betray their comrades in exchange for pardons from the Dutch. In June, the last of the leaders of the Great Burby Slave Rebellion is captured. With the suppression of the Burby's revolt, the Dutch are ruthless in their thirst for revenge and retribution. The revolutionaries are given mock trials and sentenced to the most gruesome punishment. Some are hanged with an iron hook through their ribs and weights on their legs. Others have their arms and legs broken on the wheel. Still others, including Atta and Akrabe, are slowly burnt to death. They endure their fiery and horrendous death without flinching or crying in pain. It is their last act of defiance. In their year-long war for liberation, Coffee and his men almost brought the Dutch plantation system in the Guyanas permanently to its knees. Did their internal conflicts bring them down? Did Coffee's misjudgments such as his call for peaceful coexistence contribute to the defeat? Or was a revolution such as theirs an impossible dream in the first place against a powerful colonial power? Um, so the first thing, of course, is the size of the colony, the Amerindian presence, then, of course, the large number of Dutch forces which actually came in. Whether they would have been able to put it down without the help of the Escobar Caribs is perhaps a point because as they would have driven up the river, which is how they did it, the, um, a, a large number of revolutionaries would have been able to escape if there were no Amerindians there in order to um, track them down. Um, so that is perhaps an open question whether the European forces on their own could have done anything. The third thing is, of course, that the revolutionaries, both under Kafi and under Atta, but particularly under Kafi, made some real critical strategic errors. The first one is that when Kafi had the opportunity to drive the Dutch out from Post St Andrews, when they were just clinging on by their fingernails right at the edge of their colony, as it once had been, um, if Kafi had driven them out then, um, their chances of success would have improved enormously. 
we must continue to be inspired by their ideals. They fought for their freedom against those who took away their rights to control their own destiny.